July 7th is a symbolic date in Japan history. July 7th, 1968 was the Yardbirds last show before disbanding. July 7th, 1980 was Led Zeppelin's final show in Berlin. And then there were two. Page and Plan 2001 reunited for the last time as a duet. An 8-track setlist was performed at Auditorium Stravinsky, Montreal. Considered by many to be one of the greatest forgotten treasures from the Page and Plan ventures, it's a rare presentation of old-school numbers plus a Led Zeppelin deep cut that I'm sure caught many off guard. This is an inside look at the musicians and events that resulted in a one-off show in Switzerland. Let's dive deep in reunion waters past Unleaded and walking into Clarksdale. This is Page and Plan's Last Stand in Montreux. A special book on Led Zeppelin shows at Montreux was released in 2001 to great effect reminding fans of a very important part of their life history. Their musical accomplishments in this town were legendary, with the band's five visits, great snapshots and their quest for riches. 1970 is my personal favorite because everybody was on fire, still carrying the atomic power of 69. Their return in 1971 had a killer set list with three cuts from Zeppelin IV. It was a triumphant performance just before them going back to North America and Robert's vocals feeling the pressure of touring. Their last run in October 1972 saw them move towards a more scripted type of show. The larger than life band status would be immortalized on film less than a year later. This was Jimmy's last show at Montreux until 2001. Now the town was also a temporary residence for the Zeppelin families in late 1975 due to tax exile as well as a musical laboratory with Bonzo's drum solo experiment recorded there in 1976. Their relationship with Montreux's jazz festival's Claude Nobbs was up there with Amit Ertigan as high-profile supporters and friends for the band. Robert's last time on stage at Montreux took place during his Fate of Nations tour of 1993. I seriously recommend watching this show. It's one of his best performances ever. August 2000. Sources in Brazil stated Jimmy Page and the Black Crows were expected to play at 2001's Rock in Rio 3. January 9, 2001, Page turned 59. January 17, 2001. The Rock in Rio press conference was held at the Intercontinental Hotel Sao Conrado with Jimmy Page in attendance. Both Page and Iron Maiden donated an autographed Fender Stratocaster to be auctioned via Casa Jimmy, the charity organization led by Page in Brazil. In return for his generosity, Iron Maiden invited Page to join them on stage two days later. You kinda wish they did a kid's last stand, right? Despite everybody's best intentions, Jimmy's back injury that ended the Black Rose project in 2000 still haunted him, thus he chose to decline the guest spot and just watch the show. January 19th, Page showed up at the concert and was taken to Iron Maiden's landmark show thanks to Rob Halford's helicopter ride. Halford was also on the bill for Rock in Rio, this time as a solo act. As a side note, you gotta give it to Maiden. Their Rock in Rio live album is one of their finest works in their career. It was their last show from the Brave New World tour and Bruce Dickinson's comeback was a very special time for the band. I remember listening to this in high school. Fear of the Dark was mind-blowing. Jimmy Page attended the Hour Novello Awards on May 24th, where Iron Maiden received an International Achievement Award, and famous Led Zeppelin hater Pete Townsend got a Lifetime Achievement Award. Jimmy's last public appearance before Montreux was for Roy Harper's 60th birthday on June 9th at the Royal Festival Hall, London. Past his prior Brian days on the year 2000, Robert Plant's camp had a busier agenda for 2001 with his newly formed Strange Sensation Band which became the lineup for his next studio album. I will cover the making of Dreamland on a separate episode. The Afro Cell Sound System Collective released Volume 3, Further in Time, on June 19, 2001. Why am I talking about this? Well, Robert Plant sang on track number 7 with two special guests from the Unedited era, Hossam Ramsey on percussion and the hurdy gurdy man himself, Nigel Eaton. The Strange Sensation played 16 dates throughout Europe and North America before taking a break for Plan to perform in Montreux.
There are so many characteristic sun tracks that would be natural, obvious choices. Yeah. The stuff for, for rock and roll bands like ourselves, with all the Carl Perkins, the Presley, the Jerry right, Lee. There's so many things Warren you can do. Warren Storm, yeah. But the, the thing about this song is it's really personable and it's, I don't know, it's just like a, it's like a choir. Jimmy and Robert, the duet, went into the studio for the first time since 1997. The reason? A tribute album produced by Atlantic's Ahmed Ertigan. With the name of Good Rocking Tonight, the legacy of Sun Records, Page and Plan returned to the musical style they knew very well, from their teens as well as Led Zeppelin's medleys, filled with 50s covers. The song they chose was My Bucket's Got a Hole in It. With copyrights tracing back to 1933, it was popularized by Hank Williams in 1949. The track was also covered in the 50s by artists such as Louis Armstrong, Sonny Burgess and Ricky Nelson. Page and Plan working together in a 50s covers album was reminiscent of their Honey Drippers Volume 1 album from 1984. So we could say their 2001 reunion is Honey Drippers Volume 2. A long life dream of Ahmed Erdogan to get these guys back together to play old rock and roll numbers. The influence of Erdogan and his boys cannot be overlooked. Back in Page and Plan were bassist Ian Jennings and drummer Mike Watts. Ian Jennings was a member of Big Town Playboys with whom Robert Plant performed on March 15th, 1986. Yep, that's Ian Jennings on stage with Plant. It's a small world, right? Well, it doesn't stop there. Robert Plant was a guest vocalist on the Playboy's 2004 album World of Dice with Mike Watson drums. The song was Lookout Mabel. Guess who played guitar here? None other than Jeff Beck himself. Robert Plant shared the stage with Jeff Beck in 2002, but that's a story for another episode. And let me add here that Jeff Beck joined Ian Jennings and the Big Town Playboys at Ronnie Scott's 2007. The 2001 Montreux Jazz Festival ran from July 6th until July 22nd. Three venues were used for the concerts, Auditorium Stravinsky, Casino de Montreux and the Miles Davis Hall. In a very interesting coincidence to the post Led Zeppelin story, the Black Crows played the Montreux Festival on July 10th at the same venue where Page and Plant performed. We could speculate the Crows bombed into Jimmy at some point, although with how things ended the year before, pretty sure only Steve Gorman wanted to say hi. Also on the festival was Jeff Beck, who played on the 21st, backed up by his fantastic band at the time that included virtuoso guitarist Jennifer Batten. And just because this is a deep dive video, I need to mention one of my personal favorite groups that played Montreux 2001, Sigur Ross. A groundbreaking band if there was ever one. Not only did the lead singer play a violin bow on his electric guitar, but the ensemble as a whole is magnificent. Okay, so back at the beginning. Opening night lineup at Auditorium Stravinsky included a duet of Larry Carlton and Steve Lukather, plus special guest Brian May, and a legendary show by Gary Moore. Let me repeat, a legendary show by Gary Moore. Next day's show on Saturday, July 7th was the Sun Records Night, with seven artists on the bill including Page and Plan. Both the festival's organizer Claude Nobbs and Atlantic's Ahmed Ertigan introduced them on stage. Well, I'm in the other fair where I need ready, but I just want to, see, to introduce somebody who did a lot for Montreux, did a lot for Rock and Roll, and actually he's the one who got this very heavy book. I'm so proud, you know, that a man who really was behind so many groups and behind the musician we are going to hear tonight is here tonight to introduce the next band. So let's welcome Mr. Ahmed Ertegaard. It's a very special moment for me to be able to present two of the people there uh, among the great people in the history of rock and roll. They are st still today the greatest influence on young musicians all over the world. They're the creators. Ce sont les créateurs du groupe Led Zeppelin, Plant and Page.
As a guitar player, I need to say this up front. I'm not the biggest fan of Jimmy's sound here. While I think Robert convinced him of sort of Brian Setzer his sound, but the big Zeppelin crunch was a bit too powerful, next to the upright bass and swinging drums approach. The show needed a sort of Jeff Beck crazy legs type of sound to really make the most out of the band configuration. And well, it's no surprise Ian Jennings played on Crazy Legs plus Clive Deemer, who was Robert's solo career drummer from 2001 until 2007. The show kicked with Roy Brown's Good Rocking Tonight. Written in 1947, it was later popularized by Elvis Presley's 1954 rendition, released via Sun Records. This high energy song became a nightmare for bassist Ian Jennings, who broke his string midway through. Because Ian didn't want to stop the show and look for a spare bass, he kept playing by instantly recalculating the tuning, as a string breaking alters the whole thing by one semitone. That's what I call musicianship people. He deserves a standing ovation. Fun fact about this song, it was played during the Honey Dripper set at Robert Plant's concert on July 26, 1985 at Centrum Worcester, Massachusetts. Next was My Bucket's Got a Hole in It, which had Page and Plant revisiting their soon to be released studio tribute version. With Sonny Burgess himself closing the event, there was extra pressure to get this one right. The third song on the set was a surprise, considering the evening's musical concept. One of my personal favorites from Walking into Clarksdale, Heart in Your Hand, was performed for the first time since December 1998. The swing and groove of Ian Jennings and Mike Watts made this a very special rendition, bringing it closer to the studio version. Charlie Jones and Michael Lee did a good job in 1998, but a song like this was sort of trapped in a very loud set list. Montreux 2001 allowed this song to breathe and let the elements shine like never before. Having a walking into Clarksdale number in between 50s covers made me think if Page and Plan could have toured like this instead of the distortion packed Led Zeppelin revival thing. Now something tells me in between management, Jimmy's fixation on his former band and ticket sales, plus Robert's need for exploration, such a tour was impossible. If you look at Robert's strange sensation that year, guitarist Justin Adams is like a willing version of Jimmy, going for new arrangements of the classics. The more I look into this, the more I understand Plan leaving the partnership in 1998. As Frank Zappa once said, without deviation from the norm, progress is not possible. Led Zeppelin to, to, the, to Montreux to work with Claude Nobbs and the guys in the gang here. When we arrived, we came with all this information and data about American 50s rockabilly and blues. That brought us here in the first place and it allowed Led Zeppelin to stretch into rockabilly and rock and roll. This is a song that came from the Presence album leans very heavily in that area. Uh, apologies to Johnny Otis. It's called Candy Store Rock. Next on the set list was one of the most obscure Zeppelin cuts ever. Candy Store Rock. I say this because it's clear the band themselves didn't think much about it to the point of allowing its use for a 1980 charity vinyl by the name of The Summit. Look at the track list and tell me Zeppelin's track doesn't stand out for the wrong reasons. It's like, yeah, here you go. Take one of the least popular tracks from Presence. As for the song itself, it's an alternate take indeed, where guitar and vocals are back to the hard rocking spirit of 1976. I feel the groove leans more towards a rockabilly big band sound than Bonham's tasteful drum parts. This creates a strange mood for this Zeppelin B side. I understand why they did it, but I just think Jimmy's riffs needed a more straightforward rhythm section behind. Oh, 
Endless Sleep was next on the set, a song by American singer Jody Reynolds. It was recorded in 1957, a good continuation of the overall rockabilly concept of the show. Track number six was How Many More Years, which is a nice tribute to Howling Wolf as the source for Zeppelin's How Many More Times. A Robert Plant favorite, it was played five times during the Honey Drippers tour of 1981. This is uh, Howling Wolf, and the feature tricks on. This is called How Many More Years. written by Arthur Crudder, who was responsible for a lot of Presley's early stuff, along with Arthur Gunter. This is a Crudder song, which we're gonna end with. It's called My Beta Left Me. Next on the set was My Baby Left Me. This one is quite recognizable in the Zeppelin bootleg world, as it was played nine times during their 1970 through 1972 Hola Love medleys. Once again, the energy is there, but the rhythm section and page are not on the same page. Pun superintended. Don't get me wrong, the playing is great. It's just not as cohesive as you'd expect from such proceedings. I can see why this wasn't officially released. Maybe Page needed John Paul Jones and John Bonham to play this kind of stuff, right? The show ended with Arthur Gunther's Baby Let's Play House. Popularized by Elvis in 1959, it was also featured on Robert Plant's set at Bradford 1981 with the Honey Drippers. And just like that, Page and Plant the duet was over. Oh. Robert went back to his solo career for seven more dates including festival appearances in Europe before going into dreamland mode. Jimmy went back to attending the Music Manager Honors Award on September 19, 2001 and a Guitar World interview session for the 30th anniversary of Led Zeppelin 4. Both Zeppelin frontmen would cross paths on stage for the last time in early 2002. The day was February 9th 
a week of concerts for the Teenage Cancer Trust held at London's Royal Albert Hall. You'd think having Paige and Plan on the same bill would mean a brief reunion or guest spot, but no, nothing. Paige performed an instrumental rendition of Dazed and Confused with the Paul Weller Band. It was his last performance on a proper rock and roll stage until Zeppelin's reunion in 2007. Robert Plant performed a six-number set list with a strange sensation. His repertoire included an original cut from Dreamland in the ways of Win My Train Fair Home, next to frequent covers from his latest touring trails. The Page and Plant partnership ended in the same place it started back in 1994. London was a circumstance to go their separate ways. A bandless Page revisited the past as a guest musician. A bandleader Plant revisited the past as well, but looked into the future for the love of music. Maybe we never change as humans, but just go through the cycles of behavioral psychology and chasing new versions of the same dream. Maybe life is one song, and the song remains the same. Thank you for watching this episode. Stay tuned for the next destination. Bye bye.